As we transition from the thoracic to the lumbar spine, we cross an important landmark known as the thoracolumbar junction. At the thoracolumbar junction, the spinal column changes from a kyphotic to a lordotic curve. As I had previously mentioned during the introductory video on this topic, lordosis refers to the normal posterior curvature of the cervical and lumbar spines in the sagittal plane. Normal lumbar lordosis, which is measured using the Cobb angle, is between 35 and 80 degrees. The reason it's important to know about the thoracolumbar junction is because it is the second most commonly injured region in the spine, most likely due to the orientation of its facet joints, which may concentrate the forces created of a traumatic impact at this level. 90% of all thoracolumbar spine injuries occur in the region between T11 and L4. These injuries rarely result in complete cord lesions though, as the spinal canal is relatively wide at this level. Like the cervical and thoracic spine, the five lumbar vertebrae become progressively larger from superior to inferior to support the progressive increase in body weight that is placed on each successive vertebra. They're also unfused and articulate with adjacent vertebrae via intervertebral discs, forming intervertebral symphysis joints and articular facets forming zygoapophyseal joints. They have large kidney-shaped vertebral bodies and triangular vertebral foramina when viewed from above and spinous processes that are short, thick and horizontally oriented. Their transverse processes are long, thin, blunt and consist of accessory processes. The superior articular processes consist of mammillary processes and posterior medially facing articular facets. The inferior articular processes consist of anterior laterally facing articular facets. The thoracolumbar fascia lies on either side of these lumbar vertebrae and surrounds the deep muscles of the back and trunk. It is composed of a network of collagen fibres which form a complex arrangement of multiple fascial layers. The orientation of these fibres varies and relates to the overall function of the thoracolumbar fascia. The anterior layer covers the anterior surface of the quadratus lumborum muscle. Medially, it is attached to the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae, and laterally, it is continuous with the aponeurosis of the origin of the transversus abdominis muscle and the transversalis fascia. Inferiorly, it is attached to the iliolumbar ligament and the adjoining iliac crest, while superiorly, it is continuous with the deep cervical fascia at the back of the neck. It forms the lateral arcuate ligament of the diaphragm and passes anterior to the serratus posterior inferior muscle. The middle layer of the thoracolumbar fascia is attached to the lower border of the 12th rib and the lumbocostal ligament superiorly and the iliac crest inferiorly. Medially, it is attached to the transverse processes and intertransverse ligaments of the lumbar vertebrae. The posterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia is attached to the spines and associated supraspinous ligaments of the lumbar and sacral vertebrae. It has two laminae, the superficial and deep. The posterior and middle layers merge to form a lateral rafe at the lateral margin of the paraspinal and quadratus lumborum muscles. This fuses with the layer of the anterior thoracolumbar fascia to form the aponeurotic origin of the transversus abdominis muscle. The thoracolumbar fascia forms a thin covering and osteofascial compartment for the intrinsic back muscles, which I discussed earlier. Together with the collagenous tissues of the back muscles, it plays a vital role in the mechanical stability of the lower back by transferring load between the trunk and the lower limbs. Much of the ligamentous and muscular structures in the lumbar spine have been covered in previous lectures, including the anterior longitudinal ligament, the posterior longitudinal ligament, the ligamentum flavum, and the interspinous, supraspinous, and intertransverse ligaments. A ligamentous structure that is unique to the lumbar spine is the iliolumbar ligament, which connects the lateral tip of the transverse processes of the fifth lumbar vertebra, and sometimes L4, to the superior aspect of the posterior iliac crest and iliac fossa. The iliolumbar ligament contains strong fibers which support the stability of the pelvic girdle and limit the range of movement at the lumbosacral junction. Most of the ligaments responsible for reinforcing what is essentially the junction between the axial and appendicular skeleton of the lower limbs are found around the sacrum though, which we'll be covering in the next part. Similarly, the lumbar spine shares many of the same muscular structures with the thoracic and cervical vertebrae, 
which we covered earlier, including the intrinsic and extrinsic groups of back muscles. However, there are a number of muscular structures which are unique to this region. These include muscles which flex the hip, including iliopsoas, which I've covered elsewhere, the muscles of the abdomen, which contribute to the formation of the anterior lateral and posterior abdominal walls. These muscles flex, extend, laterally flex and rotate the trunk and provide support to structures of the abdomen. They include the external abdominal oblique, interminal abdominal oblique, transversus abdominis, rectus abdominis, pyramidalis and quadratus lumborum. The external abdominal oblique muscle originates from the external surfaces and inferior borders of the anterior halves of the 5th to 12th ribs. Its fibres travel in an anterior, medial and inferior direction around the abdomen and broadly insert, via two aponeuroses, onto the anterior superior iliac spine and anterior half of the iliac crest, the pubic crest and the pubic tubercle, and the linea alba. The external oblique muscle is broad and flat, and its muscle belly gives rise to an aponeurosis, which medially contributes to the formation of the anterior layer of the rectus sheath, and inferiorly contains the superficial inguinal ring and forms a thickening between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle, known as the inguinal ligament. The external abdominal oblique muscle laterally flexes the trunk to the same side and rotates the trunk to the opposite side during unilateral contraction. During bilateral contraction, it flexes the trunk. It also compresses and provides structural support to adjacent abdominal structures and depresses the ribs at their costovertebral joints during forced expiration. Next, the internal abdominal oblique, which originates from the thoracolumbar fascia the anterior two-thirds of the iliac crest, and the lateral two-thirds of the inguinal ligament. Its fibres travel in anterior, medial, and superior directions around the abdomen and insert onto inferior margins at costal ends of the 10th to 12th ribs and their adjacent costal cartilages, the linea alba via its broad aponeurosis and the pectin pubis via its inguinal falcs. Like the external abdominal oblique, the internal abdominal oblique is broad and flat. Adjacent to the midclavicular line, its muscle belly gives rise to a broad aponeurosis, which contributes to the formation of the anterior and posterior layers of the rectus sheath. The internal abdominal oblique contributes to the formation of the anterior lateral abdominal wall, the inguinal canal, the lumbar triangle, also known as the triangle of petty, where the internal abdominal oblique muscle forms its floor. During unilateral contraction, the internal abdominal oblique muscle laterally flexes and rotates the trunk to the same side. During bilateral contraction, it flexes the trunk. It also compresses and provides structural support to adjacent abdominal structures and depresses the ribs at their costovertebral joints during forced expiration. The transversus abdominis muscle originates from the internal aspects of the 7th to 12th costal cartilages the thoracolumbar fascia, the anterior aspect of the iliac crest, and the lateral aspect of the inguinal ligament. Its fibres travel anteriorly and medially around the abdomen and insert onto the linea alba, the pubic crest and the pecten pubis. The transversus abdominis muscle is broad and flat and its muscle belly gives rise to an aponeurosis which contributes to the formation of the posterior layer of the rectus sheath. The transversus abdominis is also known as the corset muscle because it compresses and provides structural support to adjacent abdominal structures, essentially increasing the pressure within the tube which contains the vertebral column, thereby conferring structural support to it. The pyramidalis is a small muscle at the bottom anterior aspect of the abdominal wall. It originates from the superior aspect of the body of the pubis and the anterior pubic ligament. Its fibres travel superomedially and insert onto the part of the linea alba that is located between the pubic symphysis and umbilicus. It is a short triangular convergent type of skeletal muscle that is absent in some individuals and tenses the lower part of the linea alba. Finally, we have the quadratus lumborum, which originates from the posterior half of the iliac crest and the iliolumbar ligament, travelling superomedially to insert onto the inferior border of the 12th rib and transverse processes of the 1st to 4th lumbar vertebrae. 
The quadratus lumborum muscle is a thick quadrilateral type of skeletal muscle that contributes to the formation of the posterior abdominal wall. During unilateral contraction, it laterally flexes the trunk to the same side. During bilateral contraction, it extends the trunk. It also stabilizes the 12th rib during inspiration. Next, we'll move on to the sacral and coccygeal regions of the spine.